sandwiches and juice in here. Okay, there's our... And our breakfast. Our assembly day. Mommy's getting everything ready there. She's all dressed fancy. Where are we going? To a meeting. It's a real big meeting, huh? In Philadelphia. And how are we going to get there? On a bus. This yeah. Who's nice being silly? You going to be more silly? I went to the bank to meet Officer Wilmington. And I'd be carrying $100 million. <laughs> Why the fearlessness of the apostles in declaring Jesus' resurrection so 
all infuriates them. But no one can withstand the power and authority of the risen Christ. No matter what they may scheme against the apostles and disciples of our Lord, we know he will come off victorious. Mercy, please, my lords, have mercy. Gifts of mercy. Take a look at us. Look, that's Peter. And the apostle John is with him. Silver and gold I do not possess, but what I do have is what I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. Look, I can walk. This is God's doing. I can walk. I'm, I'm no longer lame. I can walk and look out. It's a blessing from Jehovah. Praise God. Praise John.
Father Jehovah are aware of the situation. When I saw that lame man get up and begin to walk and to leap about, I was so thrilled that all I could think was, this is of God. But I too feared for Peter and John. How could the chief priest and the captain of the temple take the apostles into custody immediately after the miraculous cure they had just performed? Men who are blinded by hatred act without reason, Juliana. And these men are filled with hatred of the bitterest kind, because its source is God's chief enemy, the devil. And their hatred is fanned by their own jealousy. What a bold and fearless course the apostles have taken. Why, these men who are opposing them are in the highest station of life in Israel. There are none higher. Caiaphas, the high priest himself, is the head and president of the court. His father-in-law, Annas, who preceded Caiaphas as high priest, is still the dominant voice in the Jewish hierarchy. Then, there are the wealthy and influential members of their families, older men, heads of the tribes and families, scribes, who are men first in the law, and members of the sects of the Pharisees and Sadducees. An imposing and authoritative group of men indeed. And viewed by the people as speaking with the voice of God. Yes, I thought of that. As we stood in the court of the temple, in the colonnade of Solomon, in the place where all the people of Israel come to offer their sacrifices <coughs> and praise to God, we've seen the apostles standing there in the midst of the crowds, boldly declaring the name of the one whom Israel as a nation rejected, and then fearlessly pointing to the leaders of Israel as those who put him to death. Well, is it any wonder that none of the others have had the courage yet to join them? But Father, why do the apostles keep saying that the older men killed Jesus? Don't they know that this will make them angry? Yes, but they don't say it to make them angry. They say these things because the people must know the truth. That's right, Linus. The people think that these older men of the Sanhedrin represent God and that they speak for Him, just as we thought at one time. So unless they know the facts, the truth of the matter, that these men really did murder the chief agent of life, the people would never come to know Jesus and receive life from Him. But Linus, my son, and the captain of the temple were particularly angry because Peter and John were teaching about the resurrection. But why? That should make them happy. Not the Sadducees, Claudia. You see, they don't believe in the resurrection. So teaching about the resurrection is bad enough, but teaching about the resurrection of the one whom they hated, well, we'll just have to trust in Jehovah and offer our prayers to him as to the outcome of this matter. <laughs> Unlettered and 
part. These are the disciples of Jesus. They were taught by him. What can we say to these men? Look, there's that man laying from birth, standing right beside them. What can we say in rebuttal? Take these men outside the center and hall until we call for them again. What shall we do with these men? We must put a stop to them before their heresy spreads. Granted, but how is that to be done? For a fact, a noteworthy sign has occurred through them. One manifest to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. Nevertheless, this work must be stopped. How can we punish them without starting a riot? True. Everyone was praising God for what they viewed as a wonderful miracle. I saw it. If we are to lay hands further on these men, or punish them in a violent way, I, for one, will not answer what the people are liable to do. Then we have no alternative. Bring in the disciples of the Nazarene. This court has heard the charges laid against it, and we have had reliable testimony borne to us that you speak blasphemies against the God of Israel, and in the name of the one whom you claim our God has raised up from the dead, this heresy must not be spread further. And this court charges you that nowhere are you to make any utterance or to teach upon the basis of the name of Jesus. If you do not stop spreading this propaganda, then we will have no recourse but to fulfill the law of Israel against you as false prophets. Whether it is righteous in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, judge for yourselves. But as for us, we cannot stop speaking about the things we have seen and heard. <laughs> supplication. The place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were one and all filled with the Holy Spirit, and were speaking the word of God with boldness. Moreover, through the hands of the apostles, many signs and portents continued to occur among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's colony. True, not a one of the others had the courage to join himself to them. Nevertheless, people were stolen them. More than that, believers in the Lord kept on being added, multitudes, both of men and of women, so that they brought the sick out, even into the broad ways, and laid them there upon little beds and cots, in order that, as Peter would go by, at least his shadow might fall upon some one of them. What faith! And everybody with such faith was cured. Also, the multitude from the cities around Jerusalem kept coming together, bearing sick people and those troubled with unclean spirits, and they would more than all be cured. It took courage to come and be cured. But a further test of courage came when the high priest and the Sadducees rose and became filled with jealousy and laid hands upon the apostles and put them in the public place of custody. And when the high priest and those with him arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin and all the assembly of older men of the sons of Israel. And they sent out to the jail to have them brought. Look, the 
men you put in the prison? All twelve of them. They are in the temple, standing and teaching the people. Bring them in, Captain. But without violence, for fear you will be stoned by the people. Now, for a certainty, we must deal harshly with these men. Yes, I agree. Yes, for a certainty, no, yes. Well, they they must, must be dealt with quickly. They have defied this very court. I knew that we shouldn't have let them off so easily. Now, the Sanhedrin will be a laughing stock, both <coughs> to our people and to the Romans as well. These men are not to be dissuaded. They are fanatic in their movie. And they are determined to make known the name of this one, whom they say God raised up from the dead. Well, we'll put a stop to it this time. Not only have they defied this court, but now they are telling all the people that this court is responsible for the death of this one, whom they say is now alive and at the right hand of God. If the people believe that this Jesus has indeed been raised from the dead, Soon they will begin to believe that we are responsible for his death. And they will stone us for a certainty. They must be stopped. We cannot tolerate such conduct further. We have arrested the disciples of the Nazarene who have become preaching in the temple. Twelve of them. They're at the entrance of the court. You, who are called Peter and John, come forward. We positively order you not to keep teaching upon the basis of this name. And yet, look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring the blood of this man upon us. How is it then that all twelve of you are found teaching in the temple after we ourselves put all of you in jail? We were put in the public place of custody, as you say. But during the night, Jehovah's angel opened the doors of the prison, let us out, and said to us, Be on your way, and having taken a stand in the temple, keep on speaking to the people all the sayings about this life. After hearing this, we entered into the temple at daybreak and began to teach, We must obey God as ruler rather than men. The God of our forefathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew, hanging him on a stake. God exalted this one as chief agent and savior to his right hand to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these matters, and so is the Holy Spirit, which God has given to those obeying him as ruler. Hear how they blaspheme and threaten this court to away with them. These are not men of God. Otherwise, would they speak to the court in this way? Men of Israel, men of Israel, Gamaliel has a word for us. Men of Israel, hear me please on this matter. Let these men be put outside for a while until I can speak to you. Very well, Gamaliel. Captain, lead the men outside and have them detained there. Men of Israel, pay attention to yourselves as to what you intend to do respecting these men. For instance, before these days, Thutis wrote, saying he himself was somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined his party. But he was done away with, and all those who were obeying him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose in the days of the registration, and he drew off people after him. And yet that man perished, and all those who were obeying him were scattered abroad. And so, under the present circumstances, I say to you, do not meddle with these men, but let them alone. Because if this scheme or this work is from men, it will be overthrown. But if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. Otherwise, you may perhaps be found fighters actually against God. We will heed your counsel this time, Gamaliel. Captain, take all twelve of the men, flog them, and let them go, and order them to stop speaking upon the basis of Jesus' name, in order that this heresy may not be spread abroad further among the people. And they 
summoned the apostles, flogged them, and ordered them to stop speaking upon the basis of Jesus' name and let them go. These, therefore, went their way from before the Sanhedrin, rejoicing because they had been counted worthy to be dishonored in behalf of his name.
house to house, they continued, without letter, teaching and declaring the good news about the Christ, Jesus. Now Stephen, full of graciousness and power, was performing great portents and signs among the people. But certain men rose up to dispute with Stephen.
expose their infants that they might not be preserved alive. In that particular time, Moses was born, and he was divinely beautiful. Now, when the time of his 40th year was being fulfilled, it came into his heart to make an inspection of his brothers, the sons of Israel. And when he caught sight of a certain one being unjustly treated, he defended him and executed vengeance for the one being abused by striking the Egyptian down. He was supposing his brothers would grasp that God was giving them salvation by his hand. But they did not grasp it. And the next day he appeared to them as they were fighting. And he tried to bring them together again in peace, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you treat each other unjustly? The one that was treating his neighbor unjustly thrust him away, saying, Who appointed you ruler and judge over us? You do not want to do away with me in the same manner that you did away with the Egyptian yesterday, do you? At this speech, Moses took to flight and became an alien resident in the land of Midian. And when forty years were fulfilled, this Moses whom they disowned, saying, Who appointed you ruler and judge? This man, God sent off his both ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel that appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out after doing portents and signs in Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for forty years. This is the Moses that said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you from among your brothers a prophet like me. To him our forefathers refused to become obedient. But they thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt. Our forefathers had the tent of the witness in the wilderness, just as he gave orders when speaking to Moses to make it according to the pattern he had seen. And our forefathers who succeeded to it also brought it in with Joshua into the land possessed by the nation, whom God thrust out from before our forefathers. Here it remained until the days of David. He found favor in the sight of God and asked for the privilege of providing a habitation for the God of Jacob. However, Solomon built a house for him. Nevertheless, the Most High does not dwell in houses made with hands. Just as the prophet says, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What sort of house will you build for me, Jehovah says. But what is the place for my resting? My hand made all these things, did it not? Obstinate men and uncircumcised in hearts and ears. You are always resisting the Holy Spirit. As your forefathers did, so you do. Which one of the prophets did your forefathers not persecute? Yes, they killed those who made announcement in advance concerning the coming of the righteous one whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as transmitted by angels, but have not kept. See how he speaks against this holy place? You would think the holy place was nothing. This man deserves to die. Hear how he speaks of the holy place. He makes us mockery of the entire race. He blasphemes against God. This oh, man is not a true prophet. You are. He not is from the hills above that you are. Willfully opposes the ring. You God. speak thus against the judicial court of Israel and remain you innocent? Is this the way you are to respect the old men of Israel? It is you yourself who has sinned against God. See how he blasphemes. We have never turned aside from Moses. Nor do we now. Look. I behold the heavens opened up. And the Son of Man standing at God's right hand. This man must certainly die. Throw oh, him outside the city. This blasphemy must be put to an end. Take this man outside the city and keep on casting stones at him until he is dead. Wicked 
ringleader in the plot to do away with Jesus. Caiaphas was the one who stood before Pilate with others of the high court, shouting, Impale him! Impale him! Thus, the blood of righteous Stephen was added to the blood stains of Jesus on the skirts of Caiaphas and all those of the high court. Yet, even as he died, Stephen cried out, Jehovah, do not charge this sin against them. We too must not be vindictive. When Jesus was reviled, he did not go reviled in return. But just as surely as Jesus foretold bitter persecution to come upon his disciples, more would die as Stephen did. It so happened that the disciples made a great lamentation over Stephen, but they decided to disperse quietly, not making their mourning too public. Some of the older men of the Sanhedrin, bent on destroying any who sympathized with Stephen, looked on as the disciples were burying him. They followed Justin to our house, where he and Juliana and the children, Linus and Claudia, had been staying since the festival. No sooner had Justin returned home than there was a loud banging on the door. Two older men of the court barged in and dragged Justin off, despite the pleadings of Juliana and the children. On that day, great persecution arose against the congregation that was in Jerusalem. All except the apostles were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. As for Justin, sadly, he was put to death. Juliana and the children came with my wife and me and settled in Samaria. But the events of those days and the things we had seen and heard and been taught by our Lord were indelibly etched on our minds. And so was the faithful endurance of Stephen and Justin and of our Lord Jesus himself. As it turned out, we saw Jehovah's hand upon us as we went to Samaria. The people there paid rapt attention when we declared the good news to them. With one accord, they listened and looked at the signs Jehovah performed. For there were many that had unclean spirits, and these would cry out with a loud voice and come out. Moreover, many that were paralyzed and lame were cured. So there came to be a great deal of joy in that city. Well, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they dispatched Peter and John to us. Then indeed, the congregation throughout the whole of Judea and Galilee and Samaria entered into a period of peace, being built up. And as we walked in the fear of Jehovah and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the congregation kept on multiplying, as it does to this day. So, do I know what it means to experience persecution? Yes. But I have also experienced Jehovah's rich blessing that he bestows on those who give a bold and thorough witness, despite opposition.
a little bit. 